Hi, I'm Naomi Jansen. I'm a certified expert clinical EFT practitioner and a certified accredited master trainer with the EFT International. Today, I sat down with a client of mine who very generously offered to share his story of his journey using EFT on his PTSD. Uh, my name is Peter Lloyd. Um, PTSD has been well, part of my life um, consciously um, since um, the mid 2000s. Um, for a long time, I was an ABC correspondent working in Southeast Asia and South Asia. Um, unfortunately, it was a time when we were bookended by lots of terrorism after 9 11. Um, so I was at Bali bombings one and two, uh, covered tsunami, um, South, uh, South Asian wars in Afghanistan, which were quite relentless through the to the 2000s, and um, and I, I had an incident, um, a quite well-known incident in Singapore where I was arrested for drug use. Um, and since that period, I started to address the issues of, of PTSD. I think I came some way along the journey, um, but not until the EFT came to my life. Um, and that, I think, has been um, a major milestone and turning point for me in terms of my getting me back. Um, I'm back, baby. Um, <laughs> Fantastic. As, much as, as much as I can say. How did you come to learn that you had PTSD? The hard way. Like a lot of people, um, I think it's interesting to me that I, I come across a lot of people who have PTSD who are extremely high functioning. They're very smart people um, and very smart people are very good at covering their tracks um, to themselves. And projecting confidence and projecting power and strength um, whilst inside the narrative is quite different. Um, and I think that I am one of those people um, that who, for whatever reason, whatever my my luck, fortune and DNA and makeup and history combined in that perfect storm where circumstances which were extremely challenging poured into a bucket where my resilience was um, not able after a certain period of time to cope with it. And so um, I, I think I have been conscious of it, certainly. I was unconsciously conscious of it, probably for a number of years before it happened. But after 2008, when there's sort of this inciting moment in my story, um, after that, very conscious of it and dabbled, I think, in self-belief and trying to sort of trick myself out of it and talk my way out of it and write my way out of it. Um, I wrote a book and those things all to some extent happened and helped. Um, but my biggest breakthroughs, my, my, my most confident remark, I'd have to say that PTC is only when I started doing EFT did I unlock um, this viscerality of PTSD and, you know, locking it and freeing myself from it, I felt like I grew taller, smarter, and more capable almost, almost overnight. Fantastic. Um, and, and can I just ask, did you ever have a formal diagnosis of PTSD? Because I know that we're differentiating now more and more between PTS and PTSD because mm -hmm. of sort of the sense of there's a stigma that goes with PTSD because it's a, a formal diagnosis. So I'm just curious if you had had that. I did. I mean, look, uh, in the context, of, and I think, I think context is everything here uh, because we've come a long way in short periods of time. I was diagnosed with PTSD in 2008 in Singapore by a psychiatrist um, who had had some experience with the Singapore military and in, in Singapore itself um, in criminal psychiatry. Um, the diagnosis was never challenged by the people who were around me at the time who were key, you know, key stakeholders of my destiny, the criminal justice system, the police, the prosecutors, you name it. It was never challenged by anyone um, because the facts were there for everyone to see. And the diagnosis which sits on top of those facts is pretty self-apparent when you look at my resume, my sort of story resume. So um, I've, I've carried that, that diagnosis with me since 2008. Um, it's um, something that was confirmed and reaffirmed again by the Commonwealth of Australia, you know, when I was taking, uh, when I was being considered for um, inclusion in the Commonwealth um, Insurance Scheme. Um, again, it was never challenged. Um, the, the story is pretty ripe. <laughs> um, the details are pretty public. Mm -hmm. um, about the kind of experiences that I had. And so it's, um, it's 
never been challenged and I, and I certainly never challenged it. I've, I've fought against it and I've resisted it, but I haven't challenged what it actually says about you. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a very important point to say about PTSD is that it's actually meaningless in a sense. It's like saying you've been diagnosed with a broken leg. You will heal from the broken leg. And with EFT, you can heal from the broken leg of the mind. It can be done. I absolutely love that analogy. Can, can you describe the effect that PTSD had on your life? I mean, you have described to some extent um, some big events, obviously, that resulted. But just in sort of the day-to-day -day experience of living your life, how did it show up? I think from my point of view, and I think the point of view here is only your own is only part of the story. The people around you who love you, care for you, and you're in your circle of influence and support would have different impressions and different um, comments on that. From my impressions, it made my brain smaller. Um, my capacity to, to be a reasoner, a thinker, to absorb information, to to have the capacity to multitask um I mean, we all make jokes about men multitasking but i was a multitasker and when you lose that you notice your power is reduced and the difference i think between then and now after eft is that the power is restored it's almost like, yes the power is restored we've had a we had a blackout we had a long blackout um, and only in hindsight do I see the blackout and the depth of the blackout. And now I feel, and I'm doing it every day in my job, in my life, um, I'm being reasonable. Uh, I am reasoning. I am capable of um, much more a cognitive function than I think I was six months ago. Fantastic. And what other solutions did you try before EFT and, and what were your experiences with those? <laughs> well, let's start with drugs. <laughs> That's a very common one. <laughs> the, the, the very first, I mean, uh, alcohol, okay. I was, I was in, in isolate When this was starting to compound in my pre-Singapore um, moment, in the years before that, there was isolation, alcohol, and dabbling in drugs and an increasing tempo in the drugs because the drugs were pain relievers. Um, I, I very strongly remember being told, and I think this, we should talk about these things. I think when I was in Singapore and I got arrested, the psychiatrist said to me, Peter, you chose the right drug. It's an illegal drug, but you chose the right one because it was giving you that at the moment you needed it, that lift the restorative joy, the happiness, it was taking the um, endorphins and giving them a twitch up, you know, because you needed them to survive. Um, and I have contemporaries from that period of time in my life as a reporter who aren't with us anymore, um, who had, we call them accidents. They fell off buildings. Um, they died in unusual circumstances. Um, there's a number of them. And um, I can only think that, the, there but for the grace of God go I and also that poor them because the pain of whatever happened to them and I'm sure I'm sure they had similar experiences to me in war zones that they had pain and they're not with us anymore so I, I actually in a weird kind of way defend drug use in the sense that it got me through the moment it's not a long-term solution um, it's not the right solution it's not the right approach but it triaged a crisis and so in that sense, uh, and I rarely say this to people, but I, I defend myself and I defend that, um, that, that judgment because at the time that was what I had and what I was able to do. Um, I think in terms of further approaches, immediately after you get you know, arrested for something as significant as drug use in Singapore, you have to take the traditional pathways, the traditional pathways being psychiatry and psychology. They worked. And in fact, between the period of my arrest in July 2008 and my jailing in December 13, 2008, and yes, the details are very clear in my mind, um, the approach I took was to go and see a psychologist and, and with psychiatry medication. I um, unpacked the mind, I unpacked the brain, I unpacked who I was, I visually learned what PTSD looked like, where it was loaded in your brain, how your brain functioned and dysfunctioned. And I came 
to terms with myself in such a way that by the time I came to go to jail, I was in a really good headspace. I was great. And the six months sentence I was given was a sabbatical from everything where I could just take a pause. And, and I read 83 books during my sentence. And I'm always proud of saying that because I used it for something purposeful. Um, it wasn't sitting there feeling sorry for myself for six months. It was about sitting there and doing something with my brain and taking another pathway of intellectual you know, stimulation. And I was ripe and ready when I came back to join the world again. And, and it was really, it was, turned out to be a really good plan. Um, then I took in to, um, uh, I took to Australia and I continued um, psychological um, care treatment under uh, the Commonwealth and continued that for quite a period of time. And uh, I came back to it every now and then when I had a, a beat in a crisis. Um, and then we met, TFT. Um, and I'd say that in hindsight, of all the things, and everyone will say this to you about EFT, if only I had known then about EFT, if only I had access 10, 12, 15 years ago to EFT, none of this would have happened. Well, it's, it, it's true, um, but it's also pointless. Um, it did happen. It has happened. And we're here now. Um, all I can say is, you know, thank the Lord for the EFT because it works. And, and maybe, you know, I always look at sort of what's the bigger purpose behind everything. And maybe the purpose of that journey is to have gone through all of those other uh, routes so that you could kind of identify uh, the differences between them and and sure. compare sort of the efficacy of EFT and the different role that psychiatry played and that that um, that cognitive behavioral therapy played as well. Were you told uh, that the chances of recovering from PTSD using those other interventions was sort of more about managing your PTSD? Um, were you told? you know, you're just going to have to kind of work out a way to live with this? Or did anyone sort of give you hope that there was a way out? Yeah, very good question. Um, in medicine, as in psychology, cure is that awful four-letter word that people don't want to use because um, it comes back and bites them. Um, and and for good, good reason, too. Um, I think that if I had to sum it up, um, before EFT, the view was that it was a managed chronic mental condition um, that you pos it possessed you and and you possessed it. You were you sort of were fellow travelers. I think I would I think most people were regarded as being a presence in your life um, and a damaging one, um, and one that can be addressed, but certainly not eradicated. And an eradication cure, whatever word you want to use for it, is, is the sort of the, I think is the crucial, the crucial question. Mm -hmm. EFT, what I think is interesting about it is that, and, and I acknowledge what you said about having had to go through the journey to get to EFT. EFT is something that doesn't challenge the veracity of other therapies, I don't think. Um, I, don't, I don't feel that it threatens the history of what I've done. I feel like it actually, in some ways, it comes along and says, um, here's the X factor. Here's the, here's the potion um, that can help um, uh, as an adornment on these processes. They're all interrelated. They don't I don't think they particularly challenge each other. I think, I think the one thing it does challenge is the idea that it's a permanent and incurable issue because it, it does challenge that because it, it is curable and cure is the word you can use. Um, that doesn't mean to say that I don't think I've got homework in the future on this topic or with this process. I don't think that just because I did it for six weeks that um, bang, I'm out. Um, I think that I have to... In the same way that I, um, you know, have to go for a walk, have to go to the gym, have to um, um, make sure that I don't eat too much, have to make sure that I don't drink too much. Um, I have to maintain focus on the important role that EFT can play in my life as an ongoing tool in my toolkit. Um, I think the toolkit question is actually a great way of describing it. I can give you an example. Recently, I came across a, a stressful situation, a distressing situation in my family about an aging parent. And I had to tap my way through it. And, and I did. Um, and afterwards, I felt 
a great lightening and a great relief and a great deal of focus about how to address the issues that this parental issue raised. So um, it's part of my life toolkit and I want to continue working with um, EFT to be able to make it so part of my life toolkit that it's as natural to me as breathing or, you know, reaching for water to, to survive. Um, and I, I think it's an essential part of my toolkit. Um, and I think it would be wrong to think that it, it eliminates other things or, it, 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 you know, it wins a horse race. It's not a horse race. It's all about having a lot of tools. But this is the, tool, this is the jewel of the toolbox. Your analogy and, and, the, and the way that it works in sort of adjunct to other things is, is really important because EFT is not a substitute for getting exercise and, and yeah. getting enough water and things like that. Uh, it does tend to, because of the role that it plays in uh, regulating you, regulating stress and so on in the body, it makes everything else you do that much more powerful. So you don't kind of fight yeah. against the other things that you're doing, yeah. it, help, it helps you get a, a, a better effect from all of that. And which kind of leads into my next question, which touches on sort of the science, uh, how much, if anything, and you don't have to explain all of what it was, but just sort of to get an idea of the amount of understanding you had about the science behind EFT before beginning. Not a great deal above and beyond the architecture of it. Um, what I did do was, and I think this is an, an interesting thing about where it appears in the timeline of your journey, is that I took a, a step into the dark. It was, a, it was a faith step. I had hope and confidence um, in, in that it would work because of the simplicity of the proposition, and I don't mean to make it sound like what you do is simple because it's not, it's actually deeply complicated and very and very nuanced. But the headlines are pretty straightforward, um, that you can, through engagement with your body, um, unlock energy, unlock pain, and restore functionality. It's, um, it's, it's a very simple cleansing and restoration process, and I draw back to the analogy I made about um, blackouts and power, is that it is about putting the power back on your brain. And, and you know, this connects to this, right? This is not orbiting separately <laughs> to the rest of the body. And that's a very important thing that um, in consciousness of your um your mind is you have to attach it to the body and the body tells you things. Well, what shocked me, and, and I mean shocked, shocked me, was 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 how visceral EFT was in my body in, in unlocking and letting go of things. I remember an occasion where my fingers were vibrating, I mean, the pulsing of my, of my veins and the fingers and the electricity in the body going out towards my fingers and from my toes was, I have no words for it. I have no words for what happened. It just was extraordinary. Um, so that's my understanding of how I went into it. I went in as a leap of faith. And I went as a leap of faith in the same way and in no greater detail than I went with a leap of faith with psychology because I knew nothing about psychology and PTSD and I, yet I went there as well with no more information, probably less. That's a really good point. And the reason I asked the question is because there is such a, a body of, of evidence to support the results that we see with EFT, but it isn't necessarily really to know any of that, to just sort of let yourself flow with the process. Some mm. people are more interested in knowing sort of, you know, what's, what's it doing, get under the hood. And some people just say, just take me on a journey. Uh, it doesn't matter, you know, either way. Um, you said you did, you, you referred to the six weeks. That was, that was about six one hour sessions mm -hmm. that, uh, that it took to, to kind of go through this initial processing of some specific events that were underlying the PTSD that you were experiencing. Um, besides that, 
example that you gave of feeling that energy moving out of your hands and what was going on in your veins and in your body, was there anything else surprising about the experience of doing those EFT sessions? Two things. Um, one was how easily you could go from room to room, if you're calling it rooms in the analogy, room to room, you'd knock on the door and hello, out comes something. <laughs> that that was extraordinary. Um, and I think what it tells you is, is that um, is that the remedy doesn't have to go too far. The journey is not far from commencement to success. And I think that's really important and powerful because for you, it's it's achieving something. But for me, it's like it's like the validation of the process. Um, the second thing I would say about it is, is that, and again, to go back to viscerality, is it was incredibly surprising to me how much you, you feel when you um, meet those moments of your psychology, how much you feel it leave you, how much you feel um, your body responding to the process. It is quite something. It's quite something. Yeah, that's something. And when you think of PTSD now, what role does PTSD play in your life? I wouldn't say, um, you know, bye bye. Um, but I think um, uh, because because I don't want to be, I don't want to sort of be a fool and think that you know, oh well, six weeks we're done. Because um, you, you were talking about, you know, in in the broadest sense, um, a lifetime. But in the in the critical chronic sense, twenty odd years of reporting, um, I don't think you solve the puzzle in six weeks. What we did was um, energize, I think, my body and my mind, and I think I've been working with the successes that we've had, um, and I think that um, in in a in a period of time not far from now, I would like to resume it and see where else the journey takes me. Um, so what I'm saying, I think, in answer to your question is, I don't know where it is. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'd like to, I thought, I'd like to think it's that way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the further it gets for me, the better. But in some senses, and this is kind of weird, is that um, it's part of who I am. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that it would be... I don't want to invite trouble, but I don't, I don't in some ways want to forget it either. Um, the story of me is the story of me and PTSD in my life. In, in the same way that you say, I can't airbrush away all that is bad or that turned out not great in your life. I think the same goes for PTSD. It's in the wagon with you. The question is who's driving? And the question is what voice does it have? And how much of a voice does it have in in what goes on up here? Um, you know, the inner monologue, um, I prefer it's written by me. And I prefer it's not written by my little friend PTSD. Um, you know, it can sit and watch. It doesn't have a gender. It can sit and watch. Um, but um, it's not in charge. Um, and I have no intention of letting it have a go again. So, mm -hmm. you know. I think around me. Well, well, PTS, post-traumatic stress, really talks about the stress being the stress that is still playing on you from unprocessed traumatic events. Mm -hmm. And what I say to people with PTSD is that it doesn't make you, you know, uh, unaware of how impactful something was. It also doesn't take away the learning. It doesn't take away the wisdom and the experience and the depth that inevitably the hard things in our life uh, give us. Mm. But what it does is it removes you from the experience of being stuck in a reaction that hasn't processed. So what you're describing in, in that you're kind of running the show now and those traumas aren't, they still are part of your story, of course, mm. but they're not so much part of your daily life anymore, it seems. Yeah, and look, you know, like the bully at the back of the bus when you're a kid, when you tell it to sit down and shut up, it does. You know, it shuts up. Yeah. Because it doesn't have any power. The only power it has is what I gave it. And I've turned the power off. So I've, I've muted it, um, I think, is, is the analogy. Um, um, and I'll take the batteries out eventually, and it will just sit there like a dead toy. 
um, and it's on the rack um, with other things, and it's and, and that makes it powerless um, because command and control um, resides with me. And and people often question how something that you know even the the six sessions that we did when you you worked on a number of specific traumas that you know were things that the people that saw your reporting on mm-hmm. you know they had a television screen sort of protecting them from the actual truth of what you experienced on the ground and it's like <laughs> yeah as you told me you have to put it through a bit of a filter because yeah, you don't you can't traumatize, <laughs> that's right you don't want to traumatize everybody everybody watching tv so you actually experienced a lot more trauma than people were even aware um they couldn't have imagined and so by but, but those moments that you experienced those traumas those took place within a series of you know hours or minutes and so it's just always interesting to me that uh people will question that you can actually process something in hours or minutes that took place in hours or minutes um but that's easy that's easy that's easy because because the things the things um that um that um grow or or are uh, components of the, or the elements of the PTSD are almost like flash frames. You capture, you capture um, a snapshot. Um, and when I think also when you're in the business that I was in, which was capturing images, it was a video. It was video journalism. In some ways, I think we are um, we're sort of worse off because we we see it over and over and over and over. And what, what I mean by that is this. The first thing is you see it. The next thing is you film it. The third thing is you edit it. The fourth thing is you look at it again when you're editing it and you edit it and over and over again. You are, you are reinforcing at every frame, that's 25 frames per second in television, 25 frames per second reinforcement of everything that you saw that was viscerally revolting. And that's just the stuff that you filmed. That's on top of what you've remembered which is the, hor- the, the, the compounding horror of reality. Then you've got the unreality of what you filmed, which is, you know, cinema, to, cinema verite. And then, and then you've got the process of editing it. And then you've got to carry around with it how you've found a narrative that goes with those pictures. So as a journalist, you're writing to the pictures of horror and embellishing and deepening them. So it's like, it's like a layer upon layer upon layer upon layer you are you are painting yourself into a corner literally with ptsd when you do that and i think that's one of the really interesting things that i've always thought about television correspondents um and people who work in television because cameramen see the same horror they see it through the lens of black and white which is even weirder um um but all of us work in a medium which i think actually lassoes us to the ptsd over and over and over a rope to it that's exactly right. And we're wiring our brains for trauma mm. in mm. that way. Repetition is one of the ways that you wire your brain for trauma, which is why um, sometimes with, with these big T traumas, talk therapy can be kind of counterproductive for people because in reliving by talking about particularly traumatic events, they're actually reinforcing that trauma wiring in their brain and um, and, and sort of become re, becoming re-traumatized um, in in the process. So it really requires a skilled a skilled uh, practitioner in, in whatever whether you're doing uh, whatever kind of intervention so that you avoid that. One, one, one of the great mysteries to me, and I, I don't think there's an answer to this, is that when was the point of intervention when it would have been successful? Because immediately after my, my trauma, okay, take Bali bombings, for example. Bali bombings, trauma one and two, within weeks I was offered um, immediate um, psycho- psychological um, care, which would have done exactly what you've just said. And I got through that really fast mm-hmm. by lying because um, I didn't want to talk about it. And I didn't want to acknowledge what was probably already happening. And it was wrong at the wrong time to do it, I think, probably. Mm -hmm. But that was six years before I actually did do something about it when I had to do something about it, you know, because I was compelled to. 
somewhere in that six years, there might have been a magic moment of intervention. Um, and I don't know, and I will never know what that would have been, but um, there surely is somewhere between nothing and full, full car crazy um, when, you, when you actually address something. Um, it's, it's a mystery to me. Well, science is now saying that there's a 10 day window after something traumatic happens that you can intervene in some way and you can prevent that trauma from uh, turning into uh, contributing to PTSD. Uh, of course, tapping, it doesn't matter if it's 30, 40 years later, uh, you, you go back and revisit it because on some level, it's still being experienced by the unconscious as happening now, now, mm -hmm. now, which is why it's so vivid. Uh, and accessible when you go back in, you have to be gentle and do it carefully. Mm. What are the main differences? I mean, you've kind of touched on this already, but if, if you have any sort of any other examples of uh, your daily quality of life before compared to after doing EFT? Okay, um, well, we'll start from the beginning of the day. Um, sleep is better. On, awake, on awakening from sleep, you're more alert and, and energized. Um, I'm generally a little bit of an art person anyway, but I can still notice the difference between um, dozy, kind of fuzzy, kind of not really um, almost depression level kind of a, um, consciousness, you know, when people were to just go back to bed. I've experienced all of that. Um, but now what I would say is that... Um, I'm 110% on alert um, when I'm at work and when I'm thinking about, you know, productive, my my, my day itself. Um, I am problem solving faster. So I think things are moving faster. <laughs> Sometimes I think I surprise people by being a bit too fast is, is that um, I'm, I'm just like blurting out ideas and I'm, I'm like, I'm bubbling over with energy and I'm, I'm, my mood is even, I am joyful and I'm also not prone to um, over responding to challenging situations like getting cranky or losing your cool. I think my, um, my evenness is back. Um, I'm a Scorpio, so I was never that even. So let's face it, you know, a bit even, um, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm pretty even. Um, and I think, and I think I've got back my capacity to just to, to, my, my, if I have a special source, it's my ability to express myself. Um, and I think I've got that back. That's yeah. wonderful. And it sounds like we got rid of some triggers. So yeah, life yeah. continues to be life. But, you know, when we're less triggerable, we can kind of roll with it. And, and we're yeah. more resourced. We've got access to our, but, to our resources. And having said that, it doesn't, doesn't mean it's not challenging. I mean, there was, a, there was a day there recently where I had a kind of a night of deep... Ugh, um, just feeling bad about stuff in the family situation I was involved with. Um, but what pleased me about it was that by, by the end of the evening, before I went to bed, I'd paused the sort of the pity party and I had thought it through, I tapped it through. And after I tapped it through, I had a lightning of the, of the issue and I could see the laneways and I knew where I wanted to go and I knew where I didn't want people to be. And I had a kind of a sense of, <sighs> yes, that worked. That's exactly the exactly the right way to do it. Sort yeah. of the forensic going back, you know, mm -hmm. yourself or with a practitioner, but in the daily experience, tapping when stuff comes up to keep yourself kind of hmm. regulated. I tell people it's like brushing your teeth. Yes, you go to the dentist, <laughs> but if you don't brush your teeth, you know. <laughs> yeah. What other occupations are you aware of besides, you know, in investigative journalism? Uh, mm. that come with a high risk or indeed, you know, a high prevalence of PTSD? Oh, anyone who's involved in first responding in a civilian sense, not the sort of military and, um, you know, global <laughs> war and disaster sense. So, you know, your ambulancemen, your policemen, your frontline fire brigade people, um, your paramedics, your nurses, people who have involved themselves in, in responding to COVID, the Australian Civilian Medical Corps, all of them, all of them, all of them must at some level um, have taken on board a level of post-traumatic stress from what they have encountered or feared they would encounter. You don't even have to encounter it to get it. 
Yeah. It's just the consequences of, of the burden they must carry. And I think, you know, from an Australian perspective, um, that's something we should be very, very thoughtful about. And the metrics are there to tell you. The flood of people who are leaving the uh, medical and nursing um, um, sector um, is, is telling you that they're crying out for help. They're not well. They're not okay. They're not, they're not coping. Um, they don't want to cope. They fear they won't cope, whatever it is. There's a coping crisis going on in this country at the moment. And it's, and it's also not just them. It's the community at large. I mean, if you think about it, um, for the last, uh, what, almost two years, uh, 19 months, 20 months, we have been telling ourselves that the end is nigh uh, or hearing or fearing the end is nigh because of um, a pandemic. And it has layers of, it's, it's like any narrative, any good story, there's, you know, peaks and troughs and, you know, drama points and plot turns. And we've got one right now um, with um, the O from, from Africa. And so I think um, it's a community that, we're, that we live with, uh, in some senses, and the people around us are all, to some extent, traumatised by what's happened to the globe in the last two years. See, the, the, the trauma is probably with every single person, children included. That's true. And I, and I remember you also mentioned to me that uh, sort of um, judges and juries that sort of um, yeah. go through these trials and are exposed to horrifying evidence mm. uh, and just no one kind of, I mean, I don't think that that those people are uh, regularly given access or encouraged to kind of seek help yeah. for the effects of being exposed to that kind of material. I go higher than that. Look at the politicians, the political class that has carried the burden of managing um, the societal response to COVID. Now, whether you support one party or the other, you have to have human compassion for everyone in government, mm. in every state, in every territory, and federally, who has had to sit and consider consequential, consequential issues about how to manage and respond to a pandemic um, on behalf of and in the interests of society. And I give them, I work from a baseline, I give them benefit of the doubt. They're not there for any other reason that they, they are there for us when it comes down to it. They might be self-serving interests along the way, but the general point is they're in parliament because they want to be there to do the right thing for all of us. They have carried an enormous burden and we might want to give them a break every now and then um, when they get it wrong or they say stupid things or they're insensitive to the zeitgeist on social media. You know, it is, it is they're human beings and they're flawed and they're imperfect and they're our leaders and we've given them the, the, the mantle until we take it from them and we need to support them in some senses um, through moments where judgment isn't always great because as we know with PTSD, the first thing that falls apart is your judgment. <laughs> Well, um, Peter, we often hear people say that they're an, an EFT convert after giving it a try, but you said something particularly gratifying to hear, something along the lines of, I'm now an EFT evangelist. Now, it's yeah. tricky for practitioners to solicit testimonials without violating ethical boundaries, so we have to rely on spontaneous invitations like that, and you were expressing that you felt quite passionate about helping spread the word to those that desperately need to know that they don't have to live with trauma. So my final question is this. If you could speak to everyone affected by PTSD, either personally suffering from it or watching mm. a loved one struggle, what message would you have for them? The thing about EFT is that it is so simple to do it. Um, and the effect is almost immediate. The impact is profound. And the advantage you get from it is you get your life back. You get you back. If you feel like you've ever been lost, if you ever feel like you've got no hope, if you ever feel like nothing is working, then try EFT because it will. Well, with your willingness and openness in sharing your experience of clinical EFT, uh, someone with your journalistic credibility as a seeker of truth, there is a very good chance that people who desperately need to will see this interview and some lives may be saved. So, so. a I very so. heartfelt thank you thank to you, Peter, for having this. Thank you. Today. Thank you, Naomi. My pleasure.